Good. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. My name is Betsy Fisher Martin, and I am the executive director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. Uh, welcome to our virtual series, uh, Women on Wednesdays. And whether you're watching on Crowdcast or Facebook Live, but we're glad that you could join us. And we are excited to uh, be with you this evening with uh, two very special people. Um, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about WPI uh, for those of you who might be new to um, one of our events. We are a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute in AU School of Public Affairs that aims to close the gender gap in political leadership. And we offer academic and practical campaign training and facilitate research and discussions like this on women in politics. So tonight, I feel like we are uh, celebrating Mother's Day maybe a little early uh, because we have a special mother-daughter combo uh, to share their experiences and their expertise about women in politics and specifically about women in the House. Um, Congresswoman Kathy Manning was sworn in almost exactly a month ago today um, to represent North Carolina's sixth congressional district. Uh, but her road to office did not come easy, and we're going to talk about that uh, in our discussion. And in 2018, uh, her daughter Jenny left a career as a journalist with Bloomberg uh, to start her own podcasting company that's focused primarily on gender equity. Um, and she's also the host there of a terrific podcast appropriately titled Women Belong in the House. So we'll talk more about that uh, as well. So Congresswoman Manning and Jenny, thank you both for spending some time with us tonight. Um, I want to let everybody know before we start that we're going to save plenty of time for questions. So if you do have a question, you can just go to the bottom of your screen at the ask the question queue and type your question in there. And you can also upvote other people's questions uh, that you are interested in as well. And if you miss any of the discussion or want to share it with friends later, um, a replay will be available at the very same link that you use to register. So um, Congresswoman and Jenny, thank you so much for being here. Thank you Thank for you inviting so us. For, for having us. Absolutely. So the fun thing is you all both have inspired each other to these points in your career, which I just think is really interesting. And I'd, I'd like to start just with you telling a little bit of the story. Um, Congresswoman, let me start with you just to talk about how Jenny inspired you to run for office. And then we'll talk about how you inspired Jenny to start um, the podcast. Okay, well, I, I will tell the story the way I perceived it, and then Jenny can correct it. Uh, when, when Jenny was um, in college, she was diagnosed with a chronic illness. And um, it, it was um, a difficult time, and we were able to get her to the right doctor who um, prescribed a medication that he said would get the condition totally under control. She would lead a perfectly normal life. The problem was when Jenny called to get the prescription filled, she couldn't get it approved mm. uh, by the insurance company. And I know she spent days trying to get it approved. And then I said, well, let me, let me do it. I'm an attorney, I can get this thing figured out. And I spent two days on the phone uh, fighting with this, which I couldn't believe. We had good insurance. This was the, the medication that was prescribed by this doctor. She would tried other things. And uh, he finally said, this was a Friday night, five o'clock. And I said, you know, she's going to end up in the hospital and you're going to end up spending more if she ends up in the hospital than if you would just approve this medication. And he said to me, well, you can always go pay for it yourself and apply for reimbursement. And I said, okay, what's it going to cost? Cost. There was this long silence, and then he said ten thousand dollars. This was for one month of this medication, and wow. I was astonished. And uh, I kept fighting, and, and, and we got it approved. But it really started me thinking about what people go through. People who can't take time off of work to fight uh, nonstop for days at a time with their insurance company. Mm -hmm. People who don't know that you keep fighting and they give up and they get sicker and sicker and their lives spiral out of control. And there was something else that Jenny said to me when we were going, when she had just been diagnosed and we were going through everything. And she said, she was at the stage where she was thinking about what she was going to do for her career and thinking about, well, now I have to get a job with health insurance. And she said, I remember her saying, what's going to happen to me if they 
do away with the Affordable Care Act because now I have a pre-existing condition. Mm. And it really made an impression on me when she said that because it impacted the way she was thinking about her career. And so after the 2016 election, when I remember watching the debate on the House floor and watching them try, I mean, we had seen the Republicans try to repeal the Affordable Care Act time after time after time, but they came very, very close doing it through budget reconciliation and uh, after the 16 election. Right. And um, I was just infuriated that they were working so hard to take away a, a, a law that had that had allowed more than 20 million Americans to finally get health insurance and was protecting people who have pre-existing conditions. So that that's what really got me thinking that there is something wrong with Congress. And rather than scream at my television set, I should probably do something more productive. And maybe I should just run for Congress myself. And that's what I did. And at the time, um, you, were, you were running against an incumbent. Yes. Yeah. And we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about the differences between that race and what you learned and then and this time in just a minute. But um, Jenny, tell us about um, how your mom running for office just inspired you to kind of do something new and different and follow your passions. So this fast forward post uh, that whole situation, um, I, after school, went uh, and worked as a reporter at Bloomberg News. Mm -hmm. And I that was I had been able to cover all sorts of different work and do all different kinds of mediums there. And then in December of 2017, my mom decided to run for office and for Congress from North Carolina, which obviously is where I'm from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and normally I don't tell the story with her like this. And uh, I had a front row seat to what it was like to run for office in a way that I never had before. And I'd always been passionate about politics. I'd always uh, been really passionate about storytelling. And I felt really um, frustrated by the lack of media coverage telling the real human stories of why a record number of women stepped up to run for office in 2018. There was a lot of coverage of the fact that it was a record number of women but there wasn't much out there. I could see how hard it was to run. And there wasn't much out there about why is it that all of a sudden the time is now? And, and why was it that there are so few women in office to begin with? So I went down a rabbit hole <laughs> that ended with uh, me quitting my job to start this new media company. So I started, I convinced one of my best friends from college to join me and we founded Wonder Media Network. Uh, our, it's an audio first media company, so we make podcasts. And our mission is to amplify underrepresented voices, to inspire action, and to introduce empathy into politics, business, and culture. So our first show was um, called Women Belong in the House with the capital H. We're now in our fourth season of that show. Um, and since that was two and a half years ago now, we've produced uh, two dozen different podcast since then. So that was the beginning, all thanks to my mom's decision to take that leap. And your mom played a starring role in some of your episodes. <laughs> yes, she fittingly uh, was the was featured on our first ever episode. Um, and then in that first season, we I interviewed different women who were running from different parts of the country uh, throughout. Mm -hmm. Then when she lost in 2018, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, yeah. Um, she was kind enough to let me interview her like the day after. And then I interviewed her again this time around, um, just before the election. And once more, uh, after the insurrection at the Capitol, because she was inside, uh, sitting in the gallery and she was kind enough to let me ask her all sorts of questions for her to, to retell her story for our listeners to hear. You need to put her on a contract or something. I mean, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship. She's using my story. I'm using her story. <laughs> so, um, Congresswoman, let me ask you um, about that race in 2018 that you ran. And um, you were running against an incumbent. Um, obviously, it, the landscape changed a lot this go round because of redistricting. So um, share with folks that, 
you know, first of all, what you learned running in 2018. I mean, you got so close. Um, and then um, there was the, that episode that Jenny was talking about uh, that she interviewed you the day after you lost. I think you guys did the interview in her like childhood bedroom, if I recall, um, from the podcast. Um, and what, Jenny, you asked her, would you ever run again? And she said, no, um, because <laughs> It was the district was so it was it was gonna it was running uphill. I mean, it just the demographics of the district didn't it, it was not foreseeable. And then obviously things changed. So tell tell that story if you would, um, Congresswoman, and what what you learned from that that first race. Well, it was uh, it, I knew it was a Republican leaning district. It was Republican by probably ten percentage points. Yeah. But I just felt like there had to be so many other people who felt like I did, and things were just disastrous. Uh, and we and and I felt like we ran a great campaign. We they made our race a, a toss up pretty pretty early on because we we got out all over the district. We met with people everywhere, and I was just convinced we were going to win. I, I I thought I was going to win until seven thirty that night. I was shocked that we didn't win. And what I found in the course of the race was that I I really loved running, and that was a big surprise. I had no idea whether I would like it. The first time I had to walk into an event with I had you know I had my young staffers with me I had to walk into a place where I didn't know a soul and just walk up to people and start introducing myself and I thought I looked at my staff and they looked at me like they thought I knew what to do I thought oh I guess I'm in charge here so <laughs> I just started introducing myself to people and what I found amazing was people were very happy to say hello they were very happy to talk with me when I asked them what you know what 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 keeps you up at night what are the things you worry about People told me, and it was it was just great getting to know people in so many different settings, uh, in churches and festivals and small meet and greets, and uh, that part was great. I learned that I have thicker skin mm -hmm. than I expected. Um, I, somebody I had talked to a friend who had been a congresswoman uh, in our district, and I said, "How do you handle like the terrible ads?" And she said, "Oh, you're too busy. You just don't watch them, and um, I, you know, they hurt the first time you see them, and then you move on." And what I also learned toward the end of the campaign, when the ads got really awful, was that you don't watch live TV. You record the things you think you're going to want to watch, and you just don't watch live TV. And um, when the other thing I learned when I lost was I wasn't devastated. I wasn't crushed. I wasn't humiliated. I thought I'd done the best I possibly could. And I was very, very glad that I had that extraordinary experience. And Jenny, what was it like for you watching your mom go through that roller coaster of a race? Um, and, you know, talking to her about it and, you know, what you learn too, because you've done um, episodes on the podcast where you talk about, you know, women running and the things that they have to face. And your mom mentioned, you know, the nastiness of those, you know, negative ads. And they were actually more than negative, right? I mean, they were a lot of them just simply untrue. Um, and how women deal with that specifically. It was really, uh, it was interesting to learn about it from sort of a, uh, a perspective where I could separate myself and, and wow. really talk to lots of other women. And then it was also, it was a different matter to learn sort of emotionally and have to experience it firsthand. So one thing that I learned that was incredibly interesting um, over the course of the campaign before she lost was that most politicians lose before they win. Mm -hmm. um, even some of our most famous political figures lost before their big victory. So. That was an interesting thing. Um, as I'm sure many people watching know, women, it typically takes seven or 10 um, asks for a woman to run for office. That's part of the reason why there's such a, a gap in leadership is because women um, run less frequently. Fewer women step up to run and it right. takes more to get there. There are lots of other barriers as well, but, um, and, that made much more sense to me. <laughs> I mean, it made sense already, but it really made sense after, you know, you put all of this effort in, you're doing all of this work. There's so much energy, there's so much enthusiasm. And I could really feel I was 
privilege to be able to, I quit my job. I was doing this new thing. I moved back to North Carolina to really be able to cover and, and be part of the campaign. And there was this feeling that the campaign was doing everything they could possibly do right. Everything seemed to be going the right way. Um, and so it was heartbreaking when that night came and she didn't win. On the other hand, it was, I think I've never been more impressed with my mom and I'm a big fan, so it's saying something, uh, than I was that night because she, you know, we, we found out together at that point, it was just, I think maybe she, uh, you already knew, but we, she came in and saw the family first and then went out and gave just a really inspirational speech. And you could see all of these people on her camp who had worked on her campaign crying and all these, this huge community that she built um, that believed so much in her and just the grace with which she handled that loss was inspirational. And then she came back and won. So it, it really meant a lot both. I learned so much from an intellectual perspective, but then mm -hmm. I think even more meaningfully learned from her example, how to handle getting knocked down and then getting up again. Yeah. And, and Congresswoman, um, Talk about you know the people that work on the on the campaign and and that community that was built, um, especially a, a lot of young people. And I know we have a, a lot of students watching um, who probably, if they haven't already been involved in a campaign, want that experience, or I think should have that experience, right? And that kind of community that that you're able to build during a campaign. So I should have mentioned that actually the best part of the campaign was getting to work with so many smart, intelligent young people with the right values. And I never, I, I didn't think about what that was gonna be like, but it was, it was fantastic. They were, they were just amazing. And they put in so much time and so much effort. And uh, we, we had a great team. And of course this was 2018. So we had people coming from other states the last month. They were so desperate to get, you know, get more Democrats elected. We had, we had a couple of people who moved to North Carolina for that last month before the election to go door to door, to, to do everything, make phone calls, do whatever we needed. And they were just fabulous. And when, um, when I found out that I lost my first, I you know was with my family, and then as Jenny said, I had to go and speak to the team. I hadn't even thought about that, but my campaign manager came in and she said, "You need to." I've assembled everybody who is um, who who is on the team, and you need to speak to them before you go out. We had this huge party with all my friends and supporters, so I walked into this room, and there were probably fifty young people. And they were all just looking at me so expectantly and you could see how disappointed they were. But I knew at that moment that they were going to be taking their cues from me. Mm. And so I had to be the leader in the room. And the most important thing, the most important message for me to get across to them at that moment was they had done the most extraordinary thing. They had taken part in our political process and tried to make change. And what they did was what democracy is all about. And I wanted them to know uh, how spectacular they were, how much I appreciated what they did. But also I wanted them to know that this was just the beginning, that they needed to keep doing what they were doing because this is how we make our country better. And almost all of them went on to continue to work in campaigns or work in congressional or Senate offices. And it, it's, it was inspiring to see them uh, that night and see them get up and keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. Explain for those um, watching that didn't follow closely the redistricting in, in North Carolina and um, explain how your um, your district changed and um, and then how you, you know, came back and, and won this time and that decision to run again and um, a little bit about your campaign uh, this year. So uh, North Carolina is a state that has it is a purple, purple state. It has more registered Democrats than registered Republicans. And yet out of 13 congressional members, when I ran the first time out of 13 congressional members in a state that had more registered Democrats, we only had three Democratic members of the Congress and uh, 10 
Republicans. And the reason was they the Republicans had been in charge of the, the setting up the congressional districts. And they uh, and they did it by like our city of Greensboro, which is a Democratic stronghold, had been cut in half, sliced in half, half of it put in one district with a bunch of rural counties, the other half, which was my half, put with a with a bunch of uh, rural counties. And that's how they were able to dilute the Democratic vote. There was a lawsuit brought uh, first, it had the first lawsuit was about the state uh, uh, districts for the state house and state senate, and the court decided that the they, they were illegally gerrymandered and those districts had to be redrawn. Then they brought another case. Common Cause brought the case uh, for the congressional districts, and much to my surprise, the North Carolina Court of Appeal, after the Supreme Court refused to do anything about political gerrymandering, the North Carolina Court of Appeals determined that the that the Republicans had gerrymandered, the, the phrase they used was they had gerrymandered the state with surgical precision hmm. and ordered them to redraw the districts. So I, it was, was not expected last uh, October or October of 2019 that we would have, 2000, yeah, 19, yeah. that we would end up with a new district that would be a Democratic leaning district by, I think, uh, maybe nine points. So I went from running in a district that was Republican by 11, 10 or 11 points to a district that was Democratic by uh, by nine or 10 points. And they did it by putting my whole county into one district and adding the city of Winston-Salem, which is also a, an urban area. So um, in in your podcast that, um, re that just kind of restarted, Jenny, um, you, again, you mentioned you talked to your mom after her swearing in, but also after the attack on the Capitol, January 6th. And Congressman, I know you have it, and you told the story on, on the podcast. Um, and Jenny, you... Um, I just want to hear from your point of view and then ask your mom about it too. But just as a daughter, knowing that your mom was there and being worried and then also, you know, not being able to just in this COVID climate, actually be able to be with her for her swearing in that had to be hard as well. Uh, yes. And also yeah. there are so many harder things that people are dealing with right now. I couldn't be too, too sad about having to watch her swearing in on C-SPAN rather than being there a while, <laughs> yeah. though. You know, we, um, maybe in two years, we can recreate the, yeah. the swearing in once COVID is dealt with or something. But um, yeah, I've never watched so much C-SPAN in a week as I did uh, that, that week that she was sworn in on Sunday. And then we, um, there was a, a Zoom party to celebrate her swearing in that was very cool for me especially, but I thought it was just gonna be a casual like family thing. And all of yeah. a sudden um, I entered the Zoom and there were all these Congress people there, which was very cool. Uh, I'm a big fangirl of many of the people on that Tuesday. And then Wednesday, um, I was actually recording interviews for, we have a new mini series on women belong in the house called women belong in the white house right now. And I was doing interviews with a bunch of, um, different elected officials that morning. And at the end of an interview, um, I was chatting and someone was like, Oh, they've breached the Capitol. And I didn't really get what that meant. I think, or it didn't hit me with the, that, I couldn't figure out how that could really happen. Right. <laughs> it didn't seem possible. So ended up, you know, turning the TV on and, and then just I stayed glued to my TV the rest of the day. It was definitely scary. I feel lucky that I heard that my mom was safe pretty quickly. I wasn't held in um, too much suspense because she was able to at least text my dad to say that she was safe. Yeah. Um, but at that party the night before, uh, another representative had had thanked the family for sending her to Washington, saying that you know you know it's hard on the family. And I was like, oh, that's kind of like a nice sort of weird and funny thing to say. And the next day, I was like, cool, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. That is not an easy thing to do. So it, it put that into perspective. And then um, 
I was just really grateful that night when I finally FaceTimed, uh, we finally FaceTimed around like 1030 Eastern and she was just, I mean, she can speak for herself, but she was just energized by the fact that what she's doing is so important and that she could continue to do what she was supposed to do as a member of Congress and certify the election. And once again, it was just really powerful and inspiring to see her energy in that moment um, after going through something that was incredibly frightening. Yeah, Congresswoman, tell us about your your experience uh, that day and um, and what you did. And you took notes, very detailed notes about it. And um, if anyone wants to listen to the full story, uh, it's you the podcast that you did with Jenny was was terrific. Um, but give us a sense of of what that day was like for you. Thank you. I'll give you the short version yeah. because otherwise <laughs> we'll run out of time. But I do I, I listen to the podcast. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had this was the day that they, we had the debate on whether to certify the Electoral College uh, and Perfect. move our peaceful transition of power forward. And I they didn't want because of COVID, they didn't want all of us sitting on the floor. So I was able to get a spot to sit in the gallery and observe. Um, because as I said, I wanted to be in the room where it happened. I didn't know exactly what was going to happen in that room. But while the speeches were going on, all of a sudden there was this um, chaos downstairs and we saw them taking out, um, I, from where I was sitting, I could see them taking Steny Hoyer and Jim Clyburn out. And then the police started shouting that they had breached the Capitol and to lock all the doors. So where I was sitting in the gallery with about 30 other members, they, the police ran around and locked all the doors. And then they told, they were literally, the police were shouting from the downstairs to the upstairs. They told us to take out our gas masks, that there was gas that had been released in the um, rotunda, which was close to us. And then we just sat and waited. And then they, the, at the lower level, they were able to um, evacuate everybody who was in the house chamber on the floor. But those of us in the gallery were there for a, about another 45 minutes. And at one point they had us, they wanted us to go to the other side of the gallery. So we had to be stepping over all the refuse from the gas mask packages and and climbing underneath the, the railings that separate all the sections. And then when we got to the other side, they said, we need you all to take cover. Mm -hmm. So we had to get down on the floor, they told us to take off our member pins because they didn't want us to identify who the members were if they broke in. And we could hear them pounding on the doors around us. And we heard a pop below. And I didn't know it was a gunshot, but that was when that woman was shot trying to climb through that broken window. Uh, uh, the, the police the whole time, the Capitol Police, they had their guns drawn. They were watching what was going on. They finally said, we're going to get you out this side door. And when we do go, we want you to run all the way down to the basement. As we walked out, I did see people lying flat on the floor on the side, but I didn't, I didn't take enough time to, real, to, to look at them and realize who they were. Those were some of the people, the insurrectionists, who were flat on the floor with police holding uh, guns at them. We got, when we got down to the basement, they took us to a safe area. And they had us in this safe room with everybody else who'd been evacuated for about four hours. And at the after four hours, Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer came in and they gave these beautiful speeches about how the rioters had tried to disrupt our, our democratic government. They were trying to stop us from um, uh, carrying out our constitutional duty to certify the election results. And 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 P Speaker Pelosi said, when they secure the Capitol, we will go back over and carry out our constitutional duty. And two things struck me at the time. First of all, what she said, when they secured the Capitol, it had been four hours. That was the first time I realized how bad it must have been because I wasn't watching news feed. We didn't have a TV right. in there. And then it was very inspirational for her to say, we have to go back, we have to go right back in that room and keep voting. So it was it was quite an experience. And um, we we left and we when they finally let us out of that room, we went back to the House floor and did one of we had several votes to do. And when I got back to my office, I talked to my communications director and said, I want to call for the president to be removed, whether by the 25th Amendment or impeachment. What he did is uh, unacceptable. And he put all these people at risk. And what we we had a, today was the day that um uh, the, po the policeman uh, who who was killed, um, 
Captain Sicknick, I think is his name. Um, he he was, in, I guess, lying in state in the yeah. rotunda, mm -hmm. and we all we all had to um, move. Uh, we we all had the opportunity to go pay our respects, and then we had some discussion about it. And um, there were not only did five people die, there were 150 police officers who were injured with serious injuries. One right. police officer lost three fingers. One apparently is going to lose an eye. I mean, what happened was absolutely unbelievable and, and unacceptable. Jenny, what are your thoughts as someone who reports and talks a lot about women running? And, you know, you mentioned, you know, women having to be asked repeatedly and encouraged to run. Um, what are your thoughts on sort of this climate that we're in right now and uh, these threats and violence and the toxicity and the nastiness and, and threats that uh, members, male and female, are um, are met with. And what do you think that means for um, the future of women running? Do you think it will deter um, women from actually making the run uh, for Congress? It's a great question. I don't, the answer is I, I don't know. I couldn't predict mm -hmm. exactly. I do right. think um, something that I learned that I find really interesting is that women tend to run for office because they want to solve a problem. So right. whether that's an issue with their family, with their that's facing their family, their community, their town, whatever it is, it tends to be because um, they want to solve a problem. That, right. That's also probably true for many men, but generally speaking, it's more um, more often women are very focused on a specific problem, whereas men more often think that they would do a good job in the position. They would be a good senator, for example. So there are a couple of ways of looking at it. I think in some ways the incredible need for change, the need, the, the horrible problems facing the country, the really difficult problems, I think in some ways that's actually inspiring for a lot of women to run. A lot of women have felt called to action the same right. way that we were in 2018 and then 2020. And now um, I've talked to several organizations that train women to run for office. And once again, there are lots and lots of women who are signing up for trainings um, mm -hmm. to figure out how they could, they could step up and lead. I also think that um, the fact that we have our first ever woman vice president is really significant. There mm -hmm. are different kinds of barriers, but the imagination barrier is actually really real. The fact right. that if I asked everyone who's watching right now to close your eyes and imagine the US president, you would most likely envision an older, probably white man, if you were to imagine what a US president looks like, because that's who's typically been the US president. Right. That's also true for tons of different positions, not for governor, for, for lots of different things throughout our, our nation. And so the fact that we have an example, the fact that there are little kids who will grow up where there have always been women running in presidential elections, where you know this glass ceiling has been shattered, I think that's really gonna make a big difference. And I think that helps to counteract the fact that it is really scary and really hard to run for office, um, but but it certainly seems that it can also be rewarding. Congresswoman, what are your thoughts on that? On on more women running for office? Yeah, and in light of this, um, you know, the the violence and the um, toxicity in politics now that we're faced with, um, and sort of the extremes. Um, do you think that is a deterrent? Um, for women running in the future? Or do you think maybe it inspires, like Jenny was saying, it could inspire women to, um, to run? I, d I really don't think it's a deterrent. Now, I don't wanna minimize what happened. Sure. I know that there are many of my colleagues who were deeply traumatized by what yeah. happened. And men as, when, as well as women, let me tell sure, you, it wasn't just, uh, right. many of the men were absolutely uh, terrified by what happened, as they should have been. Sure. But I think looking at what has happened in our country, looking at the fact that that seven, well, I don't want to give the exact number, but that so many people believed the lies that were fed to them, that the election was unfair, that it was rigged, that it was stolen. There was absolutely no evidence of it. 
And I think it, I think it will encourage a lot of people to say something is broken and, and I want to be part of the solution. I don't think it will be a deterrent. I also would add that in addition to seeing more women in office um, and, see, and seeing that in terms of at all different levels, um, both the highest levels like the vice president, but also yeah. seeing more and more senators and congresswomen um, going viral on social media. I think that's really helpful. The other thing is there are organizations that have cropped up over the past decade and even longer to help women run for office and right. to help train women, to help support women, to help because it typically has also been more challenging for women to raise money. It is not more challenging for women to win. The The stats show that when women run, they win at the same rates as men at, at least. Um, so it's not that people won't vote for a woman necessarily, but there are structural challenges. It's been harder to raise as much money. It's been mm -hmm. harder to, some women may not have the same kind of network. Um, you know, there are all sorts of different barriers here, but right. there are lots of organizations that are now existing to try to change that, that are, that are actively working to recruit women and to train them and to support them when they do run. Let, Let me, me add ask one more you, thing. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Congressman. I was just going to say, as I've had the opportunity to watch the women uh -huh. uh, in my party uh, giving their floor speeches, they're from all different walks of life. And there are so many extraordinarily impressive women. If you if you turn on C-SPAN and you've listened, some of the speeches have just been incredible. And I think that will be inspiring to, uh, to young girls and to mm -hmm. other women because they can see themselves in, in the, the wide variety of women that we now have in Congress. Right. Um, Jenny, let me ask you, um, we have a question here from Caitlin. Um, she says, how do you think we can improve the coverage of women who are running for office? Even still, women get significantly less media coverage than their male counterparts, she said. It's a, it's a big question and a good question. I think it's, it's starting to shift. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, there's a huge way to go. So I think that just by nature of hopefully, um, hopefully over time, we won't be covering firsts because there will be many people. It won't be, a, it won't be notable for when people run who are women. Um, so some of it, I think will just take time. Um, the other thing I think we can all do to help is to, to be really critical readers and really critical consumers of content. Right. And notice things like that notice like oh this coverage is much different from they're covering um this woman running much different than her the person she's running against who's a man that was something that's pretty interesting for for this latest series um i interviewed former senator heidi heitkamp mm. and she talked about how um i believe it was when she was running for governor um which she she didn't win and and she often was asked um, who was taking care of her kids in a way that was like, you know, some right. people would say, oh no, they'd say like, how old are your kids in like a right. nice friendly way. And then others would be like, but wait, how old are your kids? Like, how could you possibly do this, traumatize them in this way? And she would respond by saying, oh, they're the same age as my opponents. And that would sort of shut everyone up. <laughs> yeah. like, Why does it matter how old your opponent's kids are? Yeah. It's like, well, exactly. This is the point. <laughs> um, so I think, just approaching coverage with a really critical eye is is really helpful and calling people out on coverage that's unfair. Yeah, I always say it's sort of like the old, the Homeland Security mantra, of, you know, see something, say something, right? Um, Congressman, what, did, what was your experience when we're talking about media coverage um, running in your races? Did you feel that you were treated fairly um, in your race? In my first race, when when they would describe describe me, mm -hmm. they always describe me as a community volunteer. I'm a lawyer. I have, have had a law practice wow. for many many years, and I had a um, I've had m major positions in, in charitable organizations and one national charitable organizations, and it just it just irritated me. And no matter how much my team tried to change them and say, can you call her an attorney? The other thing, um, and this is, this is small, but I found it significant. 
they never used the photographs that we sent, the press mm -hmm. photographs. And in fact, on election day, the, for when I ran the first time, they used this smiling, perfect uh, photograph of my opponent. It was probably his his house photograph. You know, he looked, you know, ca MGM cast him in that role. <laughs> Me, they dug up some photo that, that the newspaper had taken when I'd worked on some project years ago where I was where they'd said, we'd like to get a photo of you not smiling. Please. So they dug up one photo of me looking very grim and mean. And I thought, who would vote for this mean woman over this picture perfect guy? I, w I was just infuriated. It was a it was a very subtle thing. But I actually called the newspaper to complain about it and got no response. Really? I mean, it's a minor thing, but those kinds of things I think can influence the way people look at you as a candidate, how they describe you, the pictures Absolutely. they use. Because most people, I think we learned that the average person spends this less than five minutes a day on politics. So if you add us into it, that means the average person spends no time on politics. And so what they see is they see that photo, they see that description, and those things can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a great point. Um, let's see, here's a question um, from Isabel. Uh, she says, um, Representative Manning, in addition to healthcare, are there other policy priorities that you're focusing on or that you'd like to see Congress focus on that will have a positive impact on the lives of women? Absolutely. Well, the first thing we're focusing on that we ought to be focusing on is COVID relief mm -hmm. because we've seen a president who was totally incompetent um, fail to do any kind of a plan to get vaccines. I mean, we did have some great vaccines that were developed and that's a great thing, but there was absolutely no plan to then roll out the vaccines and get them into arms. So our first uh, uh, focus has got to be getting control of the pandemic and getting relief to people so we can have an economic recovery. Um, and of course, healthcare, the healthcare disparities that we had before the pandemic were only heightened by the pandemic. And we've seen a very disparate impact of COVID on people who didn't have good access to healthcare before they started, much higher illness rates and death rates. Um, education is an issue that I am focusing on. In fact, I'm, I've got my first two committee choices. I am on education and labor and on foreign affairs. And in the education committee, uh, we have so much to address. There were so many issues about um, everything from uh, differentials in the way schools are funded to big problems with student loans. Now we've got to we've got to tackle how we help schools reopen safely, um, and then jobs. How we've we've got 10 million people who have lost their jobs, and we've got to figure out how we're going to get them help people get employed again. So again, once the economy gets uh, rolling, we've got to get them. Uh, relief so they can continue to feed their families, but we've got to make sure so, some areas of the economy are going to have a tougher time coming back. So it's it's really healthcare, education, and jobs. Got it, um, Jenny. Here's a question from you for you from KC, um, who says, um, "I ran for office in my local town at the start of the pandemic, but encountered difficulties with fundraising. Sadly, I lost by a slim margin." There's a lot of setup, especially financially, that has to occur just to get on the ballot. What would you recommend those from minority and low income backgrounds, particularly women, can find opportunities uh, to enter elected offices? And I guess I would add to that, you know, what other areas of support um, should people be looking for in terms of uh, either fundraising advice or um, groups that help uh, bundle fundraising uh, dollars? I am certainly not, uh, this isn't what I do, but I do, I have spoken a lot with um, organizations like Emerge, Emerge right. Help Train Women to Run for Office, and I know that right. they're specifically, um, Emerge is specifically focused on particularly helping um, women who are underrepresented in office or people mm -hmm. who are underrepresented in position. So mm -hmm. Emerge, um, Run for Something is another organization that, that really helps people learn how to run for office and, and train on fundraising and things like that. Um, I don't know. I, I wonder, Mom, do you have tips or thoughts on, so on that? Yeah, how, did you, how did you find that fundraising for your race? Was it difficult for you or was that something that you easily adapted to? 
I had done a lot of fundraising in my own community for yeah. lots of community projects. So while it wasn't a skill that I was born with, it was a skill that I had developed. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I, I had a lot of people that I was willing to go to and call and chase after. Right. Uh, so, but, but a lot of people don't have that network that they've built over the years. So two things that I can suggest to people. Emily's List is a national organization that is unbelievably helpful to women and it helps them with training, it helps them with fundraising, and it also, when a candidate has proven herself to be a viable candidate, helps get others to support her. In North Carolina, we have an organization called Lillian's List, and there may be similar organizations in other states. Lillian's List helps women on the state level with the same thing. I went to a Lillian's List training years ago, and it was brutal. I mean, they did a fantastic job. It got you ready. Uh, they made you practice how you were going to do your fundraising. And I'll be honest with you. Uh, the secret to fundraising is you got to put in the work. You've got, you've got to get on the phone and call people. You've got to get out there and meet people. You have to explain to them why you're the right candidate. It, it, it's, you know, it's, it's the hard work that, that helps you do the fundraising. Right. And I will say um, at the Institute, we have a, um, fundraise a leadership campaign training program called We Lead. And, and we actually just did a session with our participants last weekend. The whole day we spent talking about fundraising. I'm sure we have some of our participants um, on the program. But you know, one thing that kept coming up, and you, you mentioned proving viability, was that chicken or the egg, what comes first? How do you, in order to prove viability, you need to have expended some amount of funds to get your name out, to find polling, and otherwise you're not going to be viable. But if that's the case, how do you get money? And so there was a lot of discussion about that as well. The first thing you have to, the first thing you have to do, and I, and I was taught to do this in my first campaign, yeah. is uh, you have to make a list of everybody you've ever known. Right. Everybody you went to school with, everybody, you, all your family, and you have to call them and ask them for money. Like Amy Klobuchar saying she asked all of her ex-boyfriends, right? I had two <laughs> days hearing Amy Klobuchar that do that, I called all the ex-boyfriends. And, and <laughs> you know what? It, it, you got to raise the money where you can. And, yeah. and people, you have to ask. The other thing I would, I mean, I, I defer to my mom, but one thing that I've heard a lot from these organizations that, um, that do these kinds of trainings is also that a key before you go ask people for money is to really hone in on What's your story? Like, right. why, how are you going to talk to people? Why are you doing this? And why should they believe in you? Um, and really hone that for yourself. Figure out what that is. Because if you can't say it before you get on the phone with someone and you're in an awkward situation where you're going to have to ask them for money, mm -hmm. um, you're not going to be able to do it once you're in that more high pressured situation. So right. I think, and it's not about having a perfect there is no perfect story. It's what, is, why are you authentically running? What is it that you want to do? What is it that you want to change? And what, what is it that you will do if you win? So that's something that I, that I heard that I think is really powerful. Well, just following up on that too, because there's a question about this from uh, Susan. Um, uh, and I guess either one of you on this, but um, she says, would you say, uh, I guess this is for the Congresswoman, would you say you ran a quote authentic campaign? And how do you feel about people who aren't white collar professionals running for office? I have many colleagues here in Congress who were not white collar professionals mm -hmm. uh, who are doing a great job in Congress. I think the most important thing is to be able to tell people who you are, uh, what your values are, what you care about, what you've done in your life, because what you've done says a lot for who you are and what you care about. And, uh, and in, yes, I think I ran an authentic campaign because I talked about what I've done, what I am, what I care about. And, and the other thing that you learn as you're campaigning is you, when you go out and listen to people, you also can talk about not just what you think is important, but what you know, not what's just important to you, but what's important to everybody else in your district, the people that you've talked to. When I would talk about our healthcare, Jenny's healthcare story, people would line up after I was done speaking to tell me their, the, the healthcare issues that they'd had. And I heard stories that were just absolutely horrific and, mm -hmm. and people who were so stoic, um, but who lived through things that were really just awful. And all they were asking for 
was a fair shake. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you do, if you run an authentic way and talk about the issues that are important to you, if it resonates with people, you can then share their stories as well as your own. Um, let's see, here's a question from um, Isabel who says, uh, women are leaders in their own right, but there are so many trailblazing women first who have paved or are paving the way for us. Uh, for both of you, who are your sheroes that inspired you to pursue your respective careers? You can't well, say each other. No <laughs> <to that. laughs> um, I can go first. Yeah. Uh, and I have a feeling I, I know what my mom's going to say because I have asked her a similar question before, but I'm going to steal it first, which is um, <laughs> it's hard to pick just one person. I think that, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants and you could list women through history. Another one of our Wonder Media Network shows that I um, co-create with my sister, Liz, is called Encyclopedia Womanica. And every day we talk about a different woman from history who you may not know about, but should. That's great. And every day I'm inspired by the people we're talking about. Um, so there's the answer is sort of, it's hard to pick one. But if I did have to pick one, I'm going to go ahead and say that this whole experience um, I'm incredibly inspired by my mom and also my dad and everything that they do in terms of, you know, seeing your parents do amazing things it helps to show that you can do whatever you want to. So that I'm, I'm going with her. Mom, it's your turn. <laughs> I have to say the same thing. I wish I could say that there is just one one woman who lit the way, but I've had great mentors of all different types from my third grade teacher who uh, I thought was so fabulous and who, believe it or not, actually contributed to my first campaign um, to my my mother, my, I mean, teachers, lawyers I've worked with. Uh, when When we observed Ruth Bader Ginsburg and she became sort of a hero, I, I would, my, what made me so happy about the fact that she became such a hero in her 80s, I think, mm -hmm. was that she finally got the acknowledgement that she deserved. And so often we, we pay more attention to celebrities than people who have spent their lives doing really, really tough work that have made an impact. And I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg, if I had to pick one shining light, uh, from who I didn't necessarily realize how impactful she was until her later years. Mm -hmm. She did extraordinary things, not just for women, but for our country with, with the work that she did. Um, well, that's a good, that's a good note uh, to end on. Before we do go, I, I want to make sure to let everybody know um, a couple other events that we have coming up for our women on Wednesdays over the next uh, few Wednesdays. Um, so on the 17th, um, we are gonna do a Black History Month program uh, and talk about uh, Maxine Waters and a new book about her called Reclaiming Her Time by Helena Andrews Dyer, who is a uh, reporter with the Washington Post. So she'll be here uh, to talk about that new book. Um, and then we are gonna talk about uh, the following week, um, talk to the author of a new book about uh, Kamala Harris called Kamala's Way. Um, and then later in March, uh, we have a special International Women's Day, Women on Wednesdays with Gail Z. McLemon and her new book, uh, The Daughters of Kobani, about an all-female uh, military force um, fighting um, over in Syria. So that will be um, a fascinating discussion. So we invite you to please uh, join us uh, for that as well. And uh, I just want to thank so much uh, the Congresswoman and Jenny uh, for being with us uh, today and for sharing all of their insight and um, stories along the way. And uh, we just really, really appreciate that. And um, you've, I would encourage everybody to uh, take some time and um, check out Jenny's podcast. There's a link uh, at the bottom of your screen. So please uh, feel free to check that out. And thank you both for being here. And um, Thank you so much for everybody for watching and we hope to uh, see you guys uh, real soon. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs> Good night. Good night.